Hello and welcome. My name is Jessica Adelman. I work in social media and communications for the Ehlers Danlo Society and I will be your moderator today. For our webinar today, we have Dr. Fraser Henderson Sr. presenting on the differential diagnosis of headaches in the EDS population. This webinar is part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD. A quick note about how this webinar is going to work. Attendees are muted at all times. However, you are able to type questions into the question box at any time. Dr. Henderson will not be able to see or respond to any questions until the Q&A time at the end of his presentation. Please do not send your questions more than once as it will not increase the chance your question will be answered. It will only make it harder for us to sift through the questions. Dr. Fraser Henderson Sr. earned his medical degree at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He received several accommodations as a neurosurgeon with the U.S. Navy. He currently practices in Chevy Chase, Maryland as Director of Neurosurgery at Doctors Hospital and Director of the Chiari Center of Excellence, where he is focused on the development and understanding of treatment, development of the understanding and treatment of deformity-induced injuries to the brainstem and spinal cord in Chiari mal malformation and Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. He is the inventor of 11 devices and concepts relating to the disorders of the brainstem and spinal cord, has published over 50 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and has given over 140 invited lectures with a focus on cervical cranial disorders, Chiari malformation, cancer, radio surgery, and unusual problems of the spine. Dr. Henderson is a member of the ehlers Jandler Society's Medical and Scientific Board, as well as the Neurology Working Group Chair on the International Consortium on EDS and Related Disorders. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson, for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about a, a very tough problem, and that's the differential diagnosis of headache in the population of patients with EDS and other connective tissue disorders. I, uh, my disclosure, I, I, am, um, I have invented a new craniocervical device, and um, I'm also director of, on the board of another company and or two other companies. Now, when I think of headaches, um, I'm not just thinking about migraines and tension headaches. I think about all of these things. And we're going to run through this entire list, give you an idea of the length and breadth of the, of the problem of headaches with EDS. So, um, Chiari malformations uh, appear to be fairly common in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And the Chiari headache is typically precipitated by a cough or valsalva maneuver, like holding your breath. It can be momentary, but it can also last hours, even days. It's more in the back of the head, the occipital region. There's often signs of brainstem, cerebellar, or cervical cord dysfunction. So there may be some uh, tremor, unsteadiness, uh, abnormal gait, and so on. So. Uh, Dr. Millerat and actually myself and others in a recent production have talked about Chiari as being one of the comorbid conditions of Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And the typical treatment for Chiari is a suboccipital decompression, removing the back of the skull, as shown at the arrow. And sometimes we add a dural patch to make more uh, dural space, other times we, uh, we lancinate the outer a layer of the dura, and the dura simply expands. Um, now, uh, here's a patient that had been operated on 10 years before for Chiari malformation. She has EDS, and she came back in, and you can see that the it looks like the Chiari is pressing against the spinal cord, and there's a syrinx there that that it's on the left. There's black a blackness inside the spinal cord. On the right, CSF is white. And it looks like maybe she needs another decompression. But we noticed on the CT scan that the brain looked very tight. If you look at the upper left, there's a tightness of the brain. And we obtained an MRI, and it showed enhancement, engorgement of the pituitary gland, and increased venous flow down the spine. And when we looked at the major draining sinuses, the big veins that drain the blood out of the brain, we found that there was no flow. 
So the, the blackness there is no flow. There's another view. That was, that's a blood clot. This patient had a blood clot in their brain and that was causing the headache and the memory difficulties and uh, the clumsiness and so on. And so uh, here's the magnetic resonance venogram. You can see normal flow on the, on the picture on the right and on the picture, sorry, on the picture on the left, it says right transverse sinus. Now the picture on the right side uh, shows no flow through the left transverse sinus. And remember that radiologists look at everything backwards. So what's on the left picture is actually on the right and what's on the right is actually on the left. So this is a left sinus, no flow. And we treated her with uh, anticoagulation and at one month, she had a restoration of flow uh, through the sinuses, and she returned to work, and no surgery was necessary. This young lady from Canada had a global headache that uh, rapidly increased, and she also had increasing leg weakness and urinary incontinence. I thought, oh my goodness, does, does she have a tethered cord? Then she developed a personality change, and her memory, mother said that her memory uh, was uh, had become very poor. And so we obtained this MRI, and you can see a thrombosis of the back of the straight sinus and the right transverse sinus, which is on the left. We treat, treated her with Lovenox anticoagulant, and in a couple of days she was much better. This 25-year-old uh, woman uh, from South America had severe headaches behind the eyes and global headaches and dystonic seizures, the loss of consciousness, and uh, we thought it looked like she'd slipped into coma. And we obtained this MRV and found a thrombosis of the left transverse sinus, and it was astonishing, but within a few days, she improved so much, she went from the ICU straight to home, not, not in South America, but to the local home. Now, this begs the question, how does blood leave the brain? Well, we always think about blood uh, draining through the big sinuses around the brain and then exiting through the jugular vein. But it turns out that there's rather a lot of blood that leaves the brain around the spine. When you're upright, there's increased flow through the vertebral venous plexus. So there's veins all around the cervical spine that help to drain the blood out of the brain down back down to the heart. And when in the supine posture lying down, there's rather more flow in the jugular veins. So on the left, that's the jugular vein, and that's a normal flow. On the right, you see compression of the jugular vein by the transverse process of the C1 vertebrae. And that can be compressed by the posterior belly of the digastric muscle or the stylohyoid ligament. How often does this occur? Uh, in a study that looked at uh, CT angiograms of patients, and Remember that you, you wouldn't get a CT angiogram unless there was a problem. But of those patients who went in for CT angiograms, one third of them had jugular vein compression. And one sixth of them had very severe stenosis, like what you see upper right. And 9% uh, have these extensive collaterals, like these, uh, these other veins filling and draining uh, into the spinal canal, and you can see those lateral condylar veins, which are trying to drain some of the excess blood out of the brain. And here's a patient uh, with bilateral jugular vein obstruction. And so all the blood is leaving the brain through these engorged tubal plexus veins. Now, if you increase the venous pressure, in the skull and the cranium, that causes increased intracranial pressure or intracranial hypertension. It turns out that that venous obstruction may underlie many cases of 
intracranial hypertension, otherwise known as pseudotumor of cerebri. And the way this is treated uh, is one way of treating this is putting a stent in the sinus, as you can kind of see here on the left, and on the right side is a stent in the jugular vein. That keeps that vein more open to allow a good flow out of the brain. Uh, what are some arterial causes of headaches? So <clears throat> this is a rare case of a, um, of a carotid cavernous malformation. That's a connection between the carotid artery and the veins of, uh, in front of the eye or behind the eyes. And when this happens, it causes a bulging eye, pulsatile pounding behind that eye, extremely high pressures, uh, and blindness in that eye, whereas the other eye can be completely normal. So that's, that, this occurred in a vascular EDS patient. Now, you see a little more of this. This is a, an axial view of the CAT scan of, on the left of the C1 vertebrae. And you can see that there is no blood flow through the vertebral artery there at the end of the arrow, as opposed to the other side where there is blood flow. And on the picture on the right, again, you see loss of blood flow as the artery progresses uh, up to C2. This is usually after occurs, after blunt trauma or manipulation of the neck or some kind of physical injury. Uh, and uh, it causes a suboccipital headache, altered vision, sometimes, typically speaking, dysarthria, maybe in impaired coordination or stroke-like symptoms. And so this is, this is not a common problem, uh, but it, it should be considered if you have the new onset of pain in the back of your head on one side, the suboccipital region. Uh, and that's, that is due to injury of the wall of the artery and blood gets behind the endothelium and then locks off the artery. This young lady from Canada had transient ischemic uh, events and the MRA showed that the left carotid system uh, was get, uh, getting all of its flow from the right side through an anomalous uh, blood vessel. So this young lady uh, came to the emergency room with the worst headache of her life, and um, uh, and she had had headaches for 20 years. This was this is absolutely the worst. The night before, she'd been massaging her sternocleidomastoid muscles behind her jaw, and uh, she came to the ER. and I thought she might have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, like an aneurysm. CAT scan was normal. And so I obtained a, a CT angiogram. And what we found was that the uh, left carotid was blocked off. It was a dissection. And typically, this causes a headache, a temporal headache. It can be a small pupil meiosis, maybe ipsilateral vision loss, sometimes stroke like symptoms. And in her, she had really. A, a very mild weakness, and that's all. And then we found that the other side was also stroked off. So she had bilateral carotid strokes, and it's a miracle she survived. In fact, she survived with no neurologic deficits. Okay, so let's look at disorders of spinal fluid flow causing headaches. If you have a buildup of fluid in the brain, that's called hydrocephalus, and that causes a bad headache. But in the EDS population, that would be extremely uh, uncommon. But what we do see is uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, pseudotumor cerebri, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. And this usually comes on in the 20s and 30s, women more than men, uh, and uh, with pseudotumor, almost every patient complains of headache, 
maybe visual changes, uh, and this can go all the way to uh, double vision or blindness in a small number of patients. There's often a pulse synchronous tinnitus, sort of a whooshing noise on one side uh, that occurs at the same time as, as the heartbeat. Uh, there's often pain behind the eyes. And, and if you get a CT scan, the CT is normal. If you do a lumbar puncture, so there's a normal CT for pseudotumor cerebri. The brain looks a little bit tight. If you do a lumbar puncture, Twenty, or in an obese patient, uh, greater than 25. The normal pressure is 10, but up to 15 is acceptable. Greater than 20 is considered, uh, you're in the running for pseudotumor cerebri. Perfectly normal, there are no white cells, no evidence of infection. So we treat this uh, of weight loss, helps a lot. Dimox or acetazolamide, methazolamide. Thiazide diuretics, that's Lasix. Serial lumbar punctures work, uh, or you can put in a LP shunt, lumbar peritoneal shunt, or ventricular peritoneal shunt. Sometimes uh, people fenestrate the optic nerve, take the pressure off the eye to improve vision. Some people have recommended removing part of the skull. Stenting is becoming increasingly common, as I showed you. On the flip side, there's high pressure in the skull. There can also be headaches due to low pressure. So this is an intracranial hypotension, low tension syndrome. This is due to a persistent CSF leak with orthostatic headache. When they stand up, they get a terrible headache, often with nausea, vomiting, anorexia, neck pain, dizziness, maybe double vision, changes in hearing, sometimes uh, galactorrhea. Uh, uh, with prolonged standing, there may be some facial or radicular sensory motor changes, although I can't say that I've seen that personally myself. It's often exacerbated by laughing, coughing, or compressing the jugular veins. Uh, giving uh, pain medicine does not seem to help uh, terribly much, uh, although I usually give Uracet for or uh, hypotension syndromes, pure said. A lumbar puncture, if performed, should show a very low pressure, like uh, less than six with the patient lying down. And uh, often with a low pressure syndrome, you may see uh, some evidence of old blood, xanthochromia, maybe increased lymphocytes, white blood cells, increased protein. There may be a history of a lumbar puncture or trauma or an epidural, or there may be shunt over drainage. And if we look at the imaging, we see venous engorgement. So this is a, on the left, a coronal view of the pituitary, and it shows engorgement of the veins around the pituitary, and seen also in the middle picture. And there's also a uh, thickening of the uh, uh, venous uh, drainage down along the spine. And the space between the brain stem and the skull and spine, which is called the prepontine cistern, can be diminished. Uh, finally, on the right side, uh, there's thickening of the what's called the pachymeninges, the dura, uh, in which there are blood vessels. Uh, here's a a patient with a CSF leak in the thoracic spine, and you can see the arrows point to the dura, and outside of the dura is extra dural fluid. On the right side, that squiggly black line is a dilated vein, and shown here in an axial view, spinal cord up top, white spinal fluid, and then there's that dilated vein a large amount of venous drainage down to the spine. That venous drainage, that dilation of the vein is due to the low pressure in the system. Now, uh, it's a problem if you assume too little. Uh, so here's a patient again with a Chiari. That's a good reason for a headache and they've got a syrinx there. So is the headache due to the syrinx and the Chiari? 
Well, not necessarily. Because if you look at large series of patients who've had suboccipital decompressions or PRAs, there's a significant failure rate, 20 to 50 percent. Why is this? So George Kleekamp in 2012 looked at 45 revision decompressions for Chiari malformation, and more than one fifth needed a craniospinal fusion. So he made the strong point that deterioration uh, may be due to unrecognized and untreated basal invagination or craniocervical instability. Of particular importance were signs of instability, therefore, and Included that functional studies in flexion extension of the cervical spine may demonstrate hypermobility of the craniocervical junction, in which case the decompression should be combined with a fusion. Now, uh, we see uh, that hypermobility connective tissue syndromes and Chiari appear to be comorbid conditions. 13% of Chiaris have EDS. I think that actually, probably it's a higher percentage. It's very important to remember that many EDS patients have Chiari like symptoms with no Chiari malformation. So the symptoms may seem like a Chiari. So uh, it's been this, uh, this comorbid condition uh, has been recognized now for one or two decades. But it's been recognized for a long, much longer time that chronic headache is a major complaint in Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And several authors suggested that this might be due to craniocervical instability or atlantoaxial. Now, it's not surprising when you consider that the ligaments which are affected with EDS are the major stabilizing structures between the cranium and the spine. And Goal, the uh, great Indian uh, neurosurgeon, has suggested that some degree of ligamentous instability causes microtrauma to the nervous system. This results in decreased neuromuscular control, and that causes progressive increasing instability. And this process is further worsened by malnutrition, vitamin deficiencies, deconditioning, which are very common. It's been recognized many patients have developmental coordination disorder, headaches, quadriparousis, clumsiness. Even 25 years ago, authors were suggesting that, uh, that these uh, symptoms, signs of weakness, with a result of brainstem injury. So, uh, Van der Pape and Francisca Malfate uh, showed, reported on this case, and you can see the brainstem being bent over the top of the odontoid process. That's a very kyphotic cliboaxial angle of 105 degrees. And so, they made the point that ligamentous laxity can result in deformation of the nervous system. Dr. Brockmeyer looked at 101 cases uh, of Chiari patients and found that 20% of them needed a craniospinal fusion. This was because of a kyphotic cliboaxial angle or basilar invagination or another thing called Chiari 1.5. So when does ligamentous laxity at the craniocervical junction become pathological? Brainstem compression due to ligamentous laxity uh, occurs in rheumatoid arthritis, as shown on the left, where the odontoid is pushing up on the brain stem. In the middle, this is a case of EDS. And on the right, there's craniocervical instability, uh, where the, uh, which results in a retroflexion of the odontoid. Well, in a consensus statement in 2013, uh, uh, where 17 institutions were represented, the Chiari Shrinkamile Foundation came up with uh, this report that there are three additional radiological metrics to assess basal invagination and craniospinal instability. First is the clavoaxial angle, 
grab second the grab maps to an Oaks measurement, third the Harris measurement of the EAI. So here's the clival axial angle. Normally it's about 150 degrees. But if the skull uh, bends too far forward on the spine, or if this if the cranium slips forward with respect to the odontoid, causes an abnormal angle, less than a 135 degrees is considered pathological. So this is uh, this angle here is about 105 degrees. That is very pathological. That's a medullary kink. Now the grab maps to an Oaks measurement reported in 1999 uh, is derived from a line drawn from the dura to another line that extends from the basion, the base of the skull the base of the C2 vertebrae shown on the left. If that line is more than nine millimeters or nine millimeters and more, that implies a very high risk of ventral brainstem compression. So Harris looked at 400 normal subjects and found that none of them had a BAI, a Bayesian to odontoid measurement, more than 12 millimeters, actually more than 11 millimeters. So he said, if if this measurement from the base young to a line drawn along the back of the odontoid is 12 millimeters more, you have an unstable situation. And if the distance from the base young to the top of the odontoid is more than 12 millimeters, you have an unstable situation. So this is a normal. The you can see the base of the skull. That's the Bayesian at the tip of that yellow arrow. It seems to pivot over the midpoint of the odontoid process. It's normal to move back and forth one millimeter uh, quite normally. But it cannot move more than a millimeter. And there have been a number of manu uh, uh, authors that have discussed this point. So here's an abnormal case inflection, cranium is slid forward on the odontoid, uh, and on extension, the cranium slides backwards. And so that's an abnormal translation, uh, and that reflects craniocervical instability. So uh, if you look at this measurement, there's the posterior axial line, and there's the BAI, Bayesian axis interval, and that is 15 millimeters. That is craniocervical instability. Now, you may often only see the craniocervical instability with dynamic imaging. So it might be necessary to get a flexion extension uh, uh, MRI or CAT scan to, see, uh, to demonstrate this craniocervical instability. So, patient on the left. MRI looks you know, tolerably, you know, most radiologists would say that looks fine. Uh, well, it's not. It's not, not really fine, but they say it was. But on the right, on flexion, the same person develops this ventral brainstem compression. That's clearly not, not fine. The craniocervical instability causes headache, uh, usually in the back of the head. Most have neck pain. It often radiates to the rest of the cranium, throbbing, shooting, sharp, uh, stabbing, or sharp. It's worse looking up. It's often uh, truncal ataxia. They have difficulty uh, walking, um, especially with the tandem gait that's walking heel to toe. Maybe dysmetria, dystidoku kinesia, decreased fine motor uh, function of the hands, nausea, and balance. And the treatment for that is a reduction of fusion with that block of bone you see there and the stabilization. And uh, uh, we're going to be publishing a five year data soon, hopefully. Um, and uh, we found that uh, before surgery, on average, the headaches were 8.5. After surgery, the headaches were 4.5. Note that the headaches did not go away completely. That's usually because there are many causes of headache. And similarly with the neck pain, uh, the neck pain dropped from about 8.5 down to 
Uh, sometimes we see genetic uh, abnormalities. This patient had the C1 fused to the skull. That's a Hox D3 homeotic transformation mutation, where the body normally uh, uh, sort of undergoes a segmentation process, but it gets confused and it, it separates at the wrong level. In this case, between C1 and C2, that causes a lantoaxial instability. So here's a French horn player uh, who turned out had uh, came to see me. He couldn't blow his horn anymore. The, he had a Hox D3 homeotic transformation. But I thought that um, his brainstem looked pretty uh, straight and thought really Chiari needs to be decompressed. So I decompressed the Chiari and uh, it turned out he did not need a fusion, surprisingly. So um, he's doing very well playing the French horn again. So here's a lady. If you look at that film on the right, there's a big Chiari there. There's a little basion. Um, the axis interval is rather borderline long, the stretching of the brain stem. But she had minimal uh, findings. Her headache was quite tolerable. And so I said, well, better not to operate on you. Uh, you, you. Radiologically, you look horrible, but clinically, she looked great. So I've been following her for, for about four years. Hopefully, we won't need to operate on her. Now, many headaches arise not in the head, but in the neck. They're cervicogenic. So Dr. Long, former chairman at neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, said that a quarter of their Chiari patients continue to complain of headache after the surgery. And he said that was because of upper cervical neck instability. He wanted to emphasize that mechanical instability is very important in explaining those symptoms. Now, uh, others have shown that if you have a, well, the two thirds of the population have headaches, uh, about half of them are misdiagnosed. Uh, and if you have a headache arising in the neck, that has the highest uh, uh, quality of life burden, i.e. pain, disability. So these are bad headaches, the ones that arise neck. Now, in the EDS population, we see uh, it would appear, uh, although there'd been no epidemiology, uh, but we're seeing more instability between C1 and C2. Look at the picture, you'll see that the facet joint uh, is, uh, appears to be coming apart there. That's an atlantoaxial instability. And this has been reported by a number of authors. Uh, in, in neurosurgery, we're used to seeing uh, this condition on the left, that's a normal looking C spine, but that patient, when they flex, the uh, dontoid is separating from the anterior tubercle of C1. And that reflects uh, an atlantoaxial uh, subluxation due to loss of the transverse odontoid ligament. We don't see that in the EDS population. Look, these beautiful pictures from Professor Smith in London on the left show in black this nice transverse odontoid ligament. On the right, that ligament is missing, and, and that's a high-grade lesion. That patient would have atlantoaxial instability. But that's not what we see in EDS. Uh, what we see is ALAR ligament incompetence. Uh, the ALAR ligament is required to prevent excessive rotation of the odontoid. Uh, so normally, when you turn your head full left or full right, there's a 23 to 39 degree angle between C1 and C2. Normally it's less than 35 degrees. So C1 never angles more than five degrees on C2. Uh, and, uh, but overstretching the ALAR ligament, shown there on the red arrow, can cause incompetence of that ligament and then the neck rotates too far. And if it 
rotates to 42 degrees, we call that unstable. So Professor uh, Smith shows these beautiful pictures on the left, normal alar ligaments in black, above the white band there. And uh, over on the right, that ligament is difficult to see. That's a high-grade lesion that would cause incompetence of the alar ligament and atlantoaxial instability. So the lower left is a picture of rotation of C1 upon C2. And you can see that the facet joint has almost become dislocated. That's an unstable facet. Now, at, if C1 rotates on C2 40 degrees, uh, that causes stretching and kinking of the vertebral arteries. And at 45 degrees, there's occlusion of both vertebral arteries. So blood has to get to the brainstem coming from the carotid circulation, not as it normally does from the vertebral artery circulation. So we, uh, and over on the right, you can see how I measure between C1 and C2. That's a 45 degree angle rotation. That's unstable. So I get these, I make this angle by lying the patient down on a CT scanner. I ask them to turn a full 90 degrees. And then I look at the axial cuts to measure the angle between them. So these patients have suboccipital headache, often occipital neuralgia. They may have ice pick eyes, really severe eye, eye pain. Pain is worse looking up, also looking down and with rotation. You can feel that there's a tension band around the base of the skull. Many patients have syncope, blackouts, or presyncope, nausea, dizziness, elements of the cervical medullary syndrome, you know, diplopia, poor vision, hearing, imbalance, uh, weakness, sensory loss, and so on. If you touch the C1, uh, if you palpate, one on the back of the neck, there's extreme tenderness. There may be spastic reflexes, vocal cord spasm, clumsiness, and dystonia. Uh, and if you uh, touch the patient with a pin all over the body, I'll say, yes, that feels sharp, but it doesn't feel sharp enough to make them jump. So there's a decreased sensitivity to the pinprick. So uh, an incomplete uh, C1 ring can cause instability. And here, there's an axial view on the left. <coughs> and the odontoid process is eccentric over there to the right. You see the blue arrow and the red arrow. The odontoid should be in the middle. That implies that there's an incompetent alar ligament on the side of the red arrow. So that's... Uh, Treatment of this is doing a fusion stabilization uh, by putting screws into the C1 and C2 vertebrae, connecting those screws with rods, and, and then putting a piece of bone, as seen there on the left side, uh, between C1 and C2. And it's been a, uh, a very successful operation. Now, there's a thing called a Kimmerley's anomaly. And that's a bony bridge over the vertebral artery. And it's not rare. It occurs in about one in seven people. But it can cause dizziness, deafness, drop attacks, a tingling. It can cause a dissection of the vertebral artery in some patients by kinking the artery. Now, instability also occurs in the cervical spine. The, uh, here's the cervical spine uh, of a patient. Looks quite normal on the left. On the right, however, in an extension view, you suddenly see compression of the spinal cord. So uh, this is typical of some of our EDS patients. They have a, a normal MRI on the left, and then extension view shows cord compression. And the treatment uh, is an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. This particular patient had burning between the shoulder blades, headache, neck pain, sometimes breathing difficulty, gait problems, impaired visual accommodation, slight blurring of vision, numbness over the shoulders. And uh, after the 
anterior cervical discectomy, uh, all of those symptoms went away. Uh, Dr. Benchel at Cleveland Clinic showed this man uh, on the left, uh, the spinal cord looked normal, but on the right, uh, there was a stretching of the spinal cord over this kyphosis. You can see that red line, that red interval is stretched. That stretching causes myelopathy through the spinal cord and weakness, numbness, pain. That's due to unstable bending of the cervical spine. So there are a number of uh, tests we look at. These were published by Punjabi and White in 1990. Uh, traction signs, angulation, uh, looking sideways on the spine. If the flexion and extension angulation is greater than 20 degrees, that's pathological. Uh, or if you look at one picture and the angle is more than 11 degrees, that can be pathological. If there's a slip of 3.5 millimeters, that's pathological. If there's evidence of spinal cord injuries, stenosis, dysnarrowing, radiculopathy. These are all um, suggest um, instability. Now, you can also get headaches from peripheral nerve sensitization. So a nerve can get uh, injured and still be functioning, and in fact have a normal neurologic exam, but cause tremendous pain. And this is typical of occipital neuralgia. Uh, also, there are other nerves called the lesser occipital nerve, third occipital nerve that can also cause severe pain. And they're diagnosed by, if you press on the nerve, it can cause pain, or you can block it with bupivacaine, lidocaine, and if it goes away, if you do that a few times and it reliably goes away, then uh, that points to an injury of that nerve the nerve can be uh, cut or frozen with cryotherapy or heated up with, uh, with radiotherapy. There are a number of ways of treating that. So here's occipital neuralgia. It arises from this nerve. It comes out between the ring of C1 and the lamina of C2, and it can get compressed there. It causes horrible pain in the back of the head, radiating behind the eyes. It lasts hours or days. Whereas photosensitivity, a slurred speech, sometimes even imbalance or nausea, uh, but usually just the severe headache. And it's diagnosed with a block at, with bupivacaine. This lady had migraines, but she also had TIA like symptoms. So we obtained a uh, echocardiogram and it showed bubbles going from the right atrium through to the left. Uh, this is a a transesophageal echocardiogram with bubble technique, and it showed this patent foramen ovale, and so to treat this, she just had to take aspirin. Or in some cases, you can close the EFO, the patent foramen ovale. Sometimes tumors, uh, and it's not hard to understand how a neck tumor can cause headaches, but even a tumor in the lumbar spine, this is a patient with exopapillary pendymoma, when I remove that tumor, her headaches went away. And you can have headaches from tethered cord. Here's a tethered cord in the upper thoracic spine. The cord is stuck to the dura there. Every time the patient bent her head forward, she had terrible headaches. Uh, but it can also be due to tethered cord syndrome. Uh, and we often see a thickening of the, or the so-called fatty phylum, uh, but this, Increased tension on the lower spinal cord, pulling the spinal cord down, and this can cause headaches. So, well, uh, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, very common in the EDS population. That can cause typically headaches in the back of the head, radiating to the temples, also the, uh, the front of the head. They also spasm in the levator scapulae muscle, uh, and uh, this pain can waking people in the middle of the night. I, uh, it can be worsened with a neck brace, which pushes up in the jaw, worsened with chewing and talking. Uh, it can cause sleep apnea. Uh, there are a number of immune disorders which can cause headaches, like mast cell activation, cause headaches, brain fog, fatigue, uh, respiratory congestion or asthma-like symptoms. Uh, it can cause uh, of memory, concentration problems, muscle aches, typically causes uh, irritable bowel syndrome, 
and most commonly causes flushing of the skin and itching and angioedema and welts or outright um, um, severe reactions to uh, medication, the mast cell activation syndrome. Sometimes we see uh, antibodies to common pathogens like strep throat. It can cause what's called a PANDAS or pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection, PANDAS. And so these patients can have obsessive compulsive personality and headaches uh, and uh, other symptoms. Uh, there are other inflammatory disorders and uh, the category of disorders called the uh, uh, lim uh, perineoplastic limbic encephalitis disorders, emblematic of which is the anti n methyl d aspartate receptor encephalitis. So uh, the patient can have a tumor or virus or bacteria and antibodies to that tumor or virus or bacteria then attack normal structures in the brain. And this happens more often in women who can then exhibit behavioral or personality changes, even seizures, mood changes, bad sleep, hallucinations. And if you get a PET scan, positron emission tomography, you'll see these areas lighting up, showing inflammation in uh, critical areas of the brain. So headache is a very important measure of disability and suffering, but it's highly variable and nonspecific. And these diagnoses are not obvious or even intuitive, so you have to consider them and search for them. You have to be aware of the many comorbid conditions of EDS to establish the origin of the headache. Ligamentous laxity in the connective tissue population, connective tissue disorder population is an important feature of many of the conditions that generate headache. And again, I'd like to thank all my co-workers uh, who, um, uh, who've helped me understand these problems. So I, um, does anyone have any questions? I apologize, I was muted. Um, yes, we do have some questions here. Um, if anyone has any questions, please type them in, in our question box and we will get to just as many as we can. Okay. The first question is, are there any long-term effects of cervical instability left untreated? Well, uh, obviously the full range from uh, paralysis, I mean, in the, in the most severe case, to just uh, ongoing uh, you know, headache and neck pain. But, um, it's, it's a very difficult question to determine uh, when to perform the surgery. You don't want to jump too quickly, uh, and then you don't want to leave it too late. It's a very individualized uh, problem. It needs to be addressed you know, patient by patient. Our next question is, what is the most accurate way to differentiate CCI from AAI? That's, that's uh, well, uh, the, if you look at that Harris method, where we looked at the Bayesian axis interval, if that changes from a big interval on flexion to a small interval on extension, then you have craniocervical instability. And um, that's the best way to look at craniocervical instability. For atlantoaxial instability, you have to either look at the rotational views, as I showed you, where C1 rotates on C2 uh, too much, you know, more than you know, 42 degrees or more. Or if you look at the, um, at the um, uh, DMX films, the digital dynamic fluoroscopy, you can see the C1 sliding sideways on C2. And if the overlap is more than about four millimeters, then you're in the running for, for possibly having atlantoaxial instability. What can you do to strengthen neck muscles in EDS patients to prevent compression and decrease headaches? Uh, uh, isometric exercise, very gentle isometric exercises uh, and maintenance of excellent posture at all times. So never slouching, 
slumping, uh, always standing up straight, always sitting up straight, um, uh, avoiding sitting in general, which is very bad for the neck, or even riding in a car, horrible for the neck. Uh, the best things are standing and walking, too tired to stay up straight and look, to lie down somewhere. Sometimes uh, you might want to improve the diet to improve uh, muscle, increase the muscle accretion. Uh, you know, uh, being more manly would help with building up neck muscle. Um, this is a very good question, I think. What is the most important question to ask when an EDS patient with headaches sees a neurologist for the first time? Uh, I think um, you should um, ideally uh, be able to tell them if you have a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and say that you've suffered with ligamentous, uh, you know, with very lax ligaments for a long time. You've had a number of you know, uh, joint injuries and so on. And uh, could this be due to uh, you know, uh, lax ligaments in my cervical spine or between the cranium and the spine, where we know many of the ligaments tend to be lax anyway in EDS? Um, we have a couple of people who want to know how to receive a consultation from you and also some who want to know how to find a doctor who understands these issues well enough um, if they aren't anywhere near you. Um, well, uh, you can go on my website and make an appointment. Uh, I mean, that will give you information on the call and just call and speak to Tatiana. Uh, and I have a new colleague. Uh, uh, who is extremely bright and he's a gifted surgeon and um, I, I don't want to say too much good about him because everyone will want to see him and not me uh, but uh, uh, Rob Rosenbaum is um, a family of surgeons and he's uh, extremely gifted so I one could also see him then there are, uh, there are a number of people up and down the East Coast uh, come to mind, like uh, Sunil Patel at, at um, Medical University of South Carolina, and uh, Dr. Greenberg in New York, Dr. Alanese in Santu at Georgetown University, come to mind. Yes. Once laxity is corrected, can it become lax again and once again need surgery in the EDS population? Yeah, I think uh, what I have, what I'm striving, have been striving to do so over the last year, is to lessen the amount of surgery that people need. And so I think it's important to try to determine what's the major cause of pain, and to fix that, and then to uh, have such excellent posture, uh, and to. Uh, eliminate all those activities which exacerbate the problem, have good diet and so on. So in other words, hit the problem that's that's work that's a major contributor of pain and disability, try to live with the others. And um, you don't want to go down this road of doing too much surgery on everyone because the problem of ligamentous instability is not at one level, it's all the way up and down the spine. And, and obviously we can't, and we don't want to fuse the whole spine. And so it's a real, um, it's a very difficult thing to determine what levels to fuse and uh, uh, where to stop. Um, but yes, you can, uh, I mean, usually when we do a fusion, that segment is stable. And that should not develop ligamentous laxity because it's fused. It, ligaments aren't doing anything anymore. It's the bone has, uh, is accomplishing all the stability between those levels. But when you do a fusion at one level, you can uh, gradually develop increasing ligamentous laxity at the next levels. Right, next. How would a cervical annular tear play into a differential diagnosis of headaches? Yeah, I, 
I don't put much stock on the so-called annular tear. I, I mean, I don't think I've ever operated for an annular tear. I need to see you know, some real instability, and I need to see symptoms coming right from that segment to see something on radiology. Uh, but simply an annular tear does not mean much to me. I'm not impressed with an annular tear. Would you treat a patient with Botox without running MRIs and lumbar punctures on the EDS patient? And what if the patient has a history of failed back surgery? Um, well, Botox uh, might be of limited use. If, if there's a specific muscle spasm, it's causing a lot of pain. Botox might be useful for lessening that spasm. But in general, one is trying to build up the muscles Botox you know, basically weakens the muscle. It works by relaxing the muscle, eliminating the ability of that muscle to contract. But we want stronger muscles with EDS. So generally speaking, uh, it, I would say Botox is a limited use. Can you please tell us about dynamic cerebral angiograms? Well. Uh, an angiogram is done under fluoroscopy. It's, it's dynamic in the sense that it's done real time. So I often do an MRV, and I'll note that there's a stenosis someplace that seems to correlate with the patient's symptoms. I'll send them up to Dr. Liu or down to uh, MUSC in Charleston, and they'll do. Uh, angiograms, which are really dynamic films in the sense that they're live. Sometimes they can form head movements uh, during the angiogram. And, uh, and um, that, that will show more accurately where the blockage or stenosis really is. But we don't usually call an angiogram a dynamic angiogram. And it's very difficult um, it's very difficult to show dynamic changes on angiography. Uh, for instance, uh, bending the head this way or that way uh, did not necessarily show a blockage in the artery or vein that we're looking for. It's very difficult to demonstrate that. So I would not ask for, quote, dynamic uh, angiography. We have requests for... Um for specialists uh, for your kind of um, issues with on either the West Coast or in Canada? Do you have any names for the West Coast or Canada? Um, the, um, yeah, re regretfully, uh, the, the, I, I can tell you that the neurosurgeons in Canada generally are very well trained. And Canadian neurosurgery has often led, led the world in new development. And uh, I trained under a man who trained at Montreal. That's where seizure surgery was developed and many other things. But uh, for EDS, um, uh, we haven't uh, you know, found a uh, you know, champion up there for those issues. Uh, nor on the West Coast, um, uh, have we? Uh, um, I'm not familiar with anyone doing a lot of EDS work. So there are a lot of very good neurosurgeons, obviously. Thank you. And um, last question When testing for intracranial pressure, is it preferable to use an ICP bolt test to an LP with EDS patients? Yes. The problem with LP is. Uh, uh, there's so many ways to uh, make it inaccurate. A, a lumbar puncture should be done with the patient lying on his or her side. The patient should be relaxed. And the needle has to be uh, in the middle of the spinal canal, not obstructed by the dura or nerve root, which is false reading. And uh, even under ideal conditions, the lumbar puncture can give a false reading. So, um, uh, if, if possible, an intracranial pressure monitor would be 
uh, would be uh, preferred. And it's very simple, uh, easy to put in. And it's uh, quite painless. I put in hundreds, it's never hurt me at all. Um, and um, and it gives the most accurate, uh, most accurate breathing. It will also show if there's a low pressure symptom, uh, condition, hypotension. If if you have an intracranial pressure monitor, and you sit up or stand up, that pressure drops to less than minus seven or minus eleven centimeters of water or millimeters of mercury, and you have a hypotension situation, a spinal fluid leak needs to be addressed. Thank you. And that is all the time we have today. Thank you, Dr. Henderson, so much for everything. We really appreciate your talk. Okay, you're welcome. Take care now. For those of you who came late, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our website within a few days. Thank you all for attending and have a great day. All righty.